I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Through this world of toil and snares, if I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but Thee, dear Lord, none but Thee. Just a closer walk with Thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When my feeble life is o'er, time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely, o'er, to thy kingdom shore, to thy shore. Just a closer walk with Thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee. Close to Thee, let it be. Dear Lord, let it be. And we can do that because it's based on his faithfulness, not the amount of faith we have. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars, 
in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender Blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Jesus, I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit and truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, Lord, 
I give myself to Thee. Let fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Someone once said, if you don't invest much, defeat doesn't hurt, and winning isn't exciting. That's true, isn't it? You know, the amount of time, money, and effort we put into something will determine the depths of our defeat or the sweetness of our success. Passing or failing a weekly quiz isn't as rewarding or devastating as passing or failing an entire course, is it? Likewise, to, to win a national championship or the gold medal in the Olympics is much more exciting and satisfying than winning a game against the worst local team in the league. Or playing a game in which everyone gets a trophy at the end, even if they didn't show up. That just cheapens the experience, doesn't it? The trophy becomes a nice but meaningless gesture that doesn't have any true value. If you don't invest much, defeat doesn't hurt in winning isn't exciting. Today we're going to look at someone who lived their life like many people pay their bills in low monthly installments. The, the investment this man makes in his faith is never over the minimum amount payable. Please turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 12. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12. First Chronicle, or 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. As you turn there, let me give you a bit of background. First and second chronicles are the retelling of Israel's history from the perspective of the exile. And where first and second kings give us the history as it happened, the book of chronicles provides perspective. Perspective from people who are no longer part and parcel of the land that they were promised but have been taken and put in exile. So it's a, it's a seeking to understand how Israel went from being in the promised land to being in exile. Chronicles, therefore, gives us the spiritual context of what happened to Israel on the pages of history. Today we're looking at Rehoboam, who reigned from about 931 to 913 B.C. According to Second Chronicles, he was 41 years old when he took over from his father Solomon. You would think by the age of 41, Rehoboam would have developed some wisdom and character, especially with a father like Solomon who had been blessed by Yahweh with supernatural wisdom. But unfortunately, that's not the case. While in Shechem for his crowning ceremony, the people asked Rehoboam if he would remove some of the tax burdens that his father had imposed on them. You see, for Solomon to expand and to build the country to the extent that he did, he had to heavily tax the people. Rehoboam wisely asked for a few days to consider the request before making his decision. And during that time, he asked both his father's trusted advisors and his own buddies for their advice. His father's advisors understood that the people were ready to revolt. So they advised Rehoboam to be a nice guy and give the people a break. Rehoboam's friends, on the other hand, said, hey, buddy, you're a king now. Show the people who's boss. Unfortunately, Rehoboam thought more of his wallet than his people, and he refused to lower the taxes. In fact, he threatened to raise them even more. Be careful who you ask for advice. Look for and listen to real wisdom instead of seeking advice from the people that will give you the answer that you're looking for. Well, guess what? The, the people revolted, making the rebel Jeroboam their king. Rehoboam's careless, self-serving move splits the country and left him with only the tribes of Judah and Benjamin to rule over. 
Where still, he had, was more than willing to enter into a full-blown civil war that would destroy the country if the prophet Shemaiah hadn't stepped in with a warning from Yahweh. Thankfully, Rehoboam listened to the warning and the war was called off. Rehoboam then went about fortifying Judah and Jerusalem and, and building up his defenses and resources. At the same time, because Jeroboam had rejected the Levites and set up his own religious system, the priests and the Levites and anyone faithful to Yahweh sided with Rehoboam and moved to Judah and to Jerusalem. Bolstered with this influx of godly influence, things went well for the next three years for Rehoboam's reign. He strengthened his defenses and honored Yahweh by walking in the ways of David and Solomon, we're told. And this is where we pick up the story beginning with verse 1 of chapter 12. After Rehoboam's position as king was established and he had become strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord. Because they had been unfaithful to the Lord, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam. With 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen and innumerable troops of Libyans, Succites, and Cushites that came with him from Egypt. He captured the fortified cities of Judah and came as far as Jerusalem. Then the prophet Shemaiah came to Rehoboam and to the leaders of Judah who had assembled in Jerusalem for fear of Shishak and said to them, this is what the Lord says. You have abandoned me, therefore... I am now abandoning you to Shishak. The leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, the Lord is just. When the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, this word of the Lord came to Shemaiah. Since you have humbled, since they have humbled themselves, I will not destroy them, but will soon give them deliverance. My wrath will not be poured out on Jerusalem through Shishak. They will, however, become subject to him so that they may learn the difference between serving me and serving the kings of other lands. When Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem, he carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including the gold shields of Solomon had made. So King Rehoboam made bronze shields to replace them and assigned these to the commanders of the guard on duty at the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went to the Lord's temple, the guards went with him, bearing the shields, and afterwards they returned them to the guard room. Because Rehoboam humbled himself, the Lord's anger turned from him, and he was not totally destroyed. Indeed, there was some good in Judah. In many ways, Rehoboam had made it to the top. Solomon, his father, had experienced amazing success and prosperity during his reign. In fact, Israel would never be as successful or as powerful as it was during the reign of Solomon. All Rehoboam had to do was develop his relationship with God and maintain his father's legacy. Verse 14, though, sums up Rehoboam's reign. He did evil because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. He did evil because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. Rehoboam is one of the biggest disappointments in the history of Israel, not because he was the evilest. There was lots more evil going on in the kings of Israel over the the various generations. It, It was just that he didn't really care about Yahweh. Apathy. Self centeredness. Notice the verse doesn't say that Rehoboam didn't believe in Yahweh. He believed, but his belief was peripheral, always peripheral. It was always self-seeking. It it had no influence or impact on his heart. His faith was never a faith that motivated him to seek the Lord. At best, it was only a faith that motivated him to get things from God. In other words, all he really cared about was himself. Himself. After three years of serving God and successfully reigning, Rehoboam made the mistake that we all can make and often do. He made the mistake of thinking his success was self-made instead of what it really was, a blessing from Yahweh. You know, think about it this way. Rehoboam starts his reign in the weeds, so to speak. You know, he's blundered his way into splitting the country as soon as he begins and then 
He's about to embark on a civil war and in the midst of this chaotic, terrifying beginning, Rehoboam listens to Yahweh because he was in trouble. But after three years of peace and growth and success, Rehoboam no longer was interested in serving God. You know, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? It's, it's natural to cling to God in the chaos. And there's nothing wrong with crying out to God and asking for his help in our times of need. In fact, that's exactly the kind of response that God wants from his children. He wants to be our redeemer. That's his nature. He, he wants to redeem not only our souls, but our lives and our disappointments and, and our mistakes and, our, and everything. But what we need to understand that is that seeking God in the nasty bits of our life experience doesn't really give us the full picture of someone's faith. To put it another way, when we need help, genuine faith and the desire to escape whatever challenges we're facing can look pretty much the same. Right? If things are bad enough, we can look for help anywhere, including God. But when things are going well and life is good, that's when true faith is revealed. To remain humble and dependent on Yahweh in the good times. To, to acknowledge Yahweh in all of our ways in the good times. To set your heart on seeking the Lord in the good times is what points to genuine relational faith powerful enough to shape us into the kind of people God wants us to be. And since Rehoboam didn't presently need to use God, he abandoned the law and the Lord, and he lived his own life and did what he wanted. As a result, God brings Shishak, king of Egypt. Here we see some of Chronicles' perspective coming into play. This part of their history isn't just dealing with power plays and foreign politics. No, what's actually happening is Yahweh's providing his grace. Grace, I said grace. The grace of God, how, how can Egypt invading Judah be the grace of God? The punishment of God, sure, but, but the grace of God? Really? Well, yeah. Grace comes in many forms, and often the form it takes depends on the state of our hearts. The harder the heart, the more distant our faith, the more determined the mode of grace needs to be to achieve God's desired goal of keeping us in relationship with him. Shishak was the first king of the 22nd Egyptian dynasty. In the temple of Ammon in Karnak, Egypt, we have a relief on the wall of the temple that tells the details of his invasion of Judah. According to that relief, Shishak captured 152 cities in Judah and Israel. Luckily for Rehoboam, he had enough sense to humble himself before the Lord when the prophet Shemaiah told him that Shishak was about to knock on his door. As a result, the, the Lord shows mercy, and instead of using Shishak to destroy him, Jerusalem is spared, and Rehoboam is told that he will become Shishak's puppet king. So Rehoboam might learn the difference between serving God and, and serving foreign kings. And, and here is where we get the glimpse of God's grace working. Verse six, the leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, the Lord is just. I love this verse. Best verse in the passage. It's powerful in its simplicity, in its briefness. This is godly sorrow and repentance. No excuses, no mitigating circumstances. No, yeah, but... Just straightforward, profound admission of guilt. How refreshing. They didn't cry out for God to rescue them. Their conclusion was simply that they were getting what they deserved. God's judgment was just. That's what repentance looks like, and it's a rare and beautiful thing. We are much better at placing blame rather than accepting blame. And that's why we don't really resolve anything or grow as people. 
In verse 12, we're told that because Rehoboam humbled himself, the Lord's anger turned from him and he was not totally destroyed. Indeed, there were some good in Judah. God's grace worked. Rehoboam humbled himself and the result was that there was some good in Judah. What does that mean? It means that Judah was rescued from the enemy. It means that Rehoboam's relationship with Yahweh, such as it was, was restored. It, it, it means that Yahweh applied his blessings and grace wherever and whenever he could, depending upon the hearts of his people. But it also means that life for Rehoboam and Judah was not what it could have been or should have been. You know, I mean, think about it. Is that all that we can really expect from life? Some good? Is, is that all we can expect from our relationship with Jesus? Some good? Given the brokenness of our world and, and our hearts, perhaps the best is the best that we can hope for. Perhaps that is as good as it gets, but I, I don't think so. One thing I do know is that, that the life that Jesus came to give us is not that life. Jesus tells us, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Jesus wants us to live life that is full of joyous, meaningful, productive, impactful living. That sounds better than some good, doesn't it? Let's do a performance review on Rehoboam's reign thus far. In the first five years of his rule, not only has he split the kingdom and almost destroyed it or could have almost destroyed it in civil war, he ends up under Egyptian rule and Egyptian taxes. Wouldn't daddy be proud? But what comes next is what I really want us to focus on today. To me, this is the key to understanding why there was only some good in Judah. Starting with verse 9, we read, when Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem, he carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including the gold shields Solomon had made. So King Rehoboam made bronze shields to replace them and assigned these to the commanders of the guard on duty at the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went to the Lord's temple, the guards went with them, bearing their sh the shields, and afterwards they returned them to the guards' room. What's this all about? None of this detail is in Kings, by the way. Did you catch this? When Sishak came knocking, he, he carried off the treasures, treasuries of the temple and the palace. We can't even begin to estimate the millions of dollars in plunder that Shishak took back home with him. And just think about the splendor of Solomon's temple and the palace. Solomon had amassed a world-class fortune in gold and treasure that filled the temple and the temple storehouses and his palace. In a sense, what was taken was the very things that pointed to the obedience, to the, the sacrifice, to the cost of the, the faith of Israel's past generations. The legacy of godly people following Yahweh. What was taken was the blessings that Yahweh had provided. What this means is that the wealth of our faith can be taken from us if we no longer value it ourselves. Think about that. How much do you value your faith? The wealth of our faith can be taken from us if we no longer value it ourselves. The joy of our faith can be taken from us and we're only left with some good. In 1 Kings 10, 16 and 17, we're told that King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold, each containing 15 pounds of gold. 200. He also made 300 small shields, each containing between four and five pounds of gold. If we were to line up all these pure gold shields end to end, we would have a line as long as a football field with a combined weight of 2,041 kilograms of gold. And that's just one of the treasures that Shishak took. Imagine. I want you to think about these gold shields for a moment. 
We get, we get a hint in this, as to what they were being used for. The, these fine treasures that Solomon had made were stored in the palace. And any time that Solomon visited the temple, his guards would take these 500 shields and, and they would line up on both sides to the entrance of the temple. And by doing this, they formed a corridor of gold shields that Solomon would walk through as he entered the temple. What an image. And just try and imagine how impressive this must have looked. 500 of Solomon's finest warriors holding 500 shields of pure, brilliant, gleaming gold. As Solomon left the palace and began to walk into the temple, the sun would sparkle and radiate off these shields and polished splendor, blinding, blinding light. But more important than the appearance was the significance Shields signify protection, security, safety. And the fact that they were made of gold signifies purity, integrity, excellence, and blessing. So these shields are are symbols of Israel's glory. Not just shields. They were a symbol of the power, prosperity, and the purity of a people committed to God. And every time that Solomon entered the temple, he was reminded that the glory and the peace of Israel was the direct result of God's blessing. But now all 500 shields were gone. Now these gleaming symbols of of a pure nation blessed by God were in Egypt. Oh, Egypt. Why Egypt? How ironic. The land of their former bondage. How sad. What I find even more disturbing is that Rehoboam deals with it. And it doesn't really seem to bother him. Rehoboam just replaces the old gold shields with new ones made of brass. Then just as his father did before him, he he had the shields taken to the temple any time he went there to worship. From a distance, the procession of gleaming shields would have been almost as impressive as the shields of gold they replaced. But they weren't the same at all. They were only cheap substitutes. They were stand-ins for the real thing, but they were nothing like the real thing. You see, whereas gold symbolizes purity, integrity, and excellence, brass symbolizes the ordinary, the common, the impure. Because bronze is an alloy made up of many metals. Where once there was a gleaming symbol of exodus, Excellence, commitment, and blessing at the entrance of the temple now stood the symbol of the ordinary, of the unimpressive. Where once stood a blazing symbol of purity now stood a compromised symbol of impurity. Things on the surface may have looked somewhat the same, but things couldn't be any more different. Remember that God had allowed this plundering to happen because the people had turned their backs on him. So God decided to give them a tangible symbol of their hearts. This is really what we're talking about here. He gave them a tangible symbol to look at that reflected what was in their own hearts in relation to him. Where once there was excellence, purity, and integrity, and commitment, now was a substandard worldly impurity. What? But what bothers me the most about this sorry exchange is that Rebom doesn't really seem to care. He still had his shiny shields. He still could play at the entrance of the temple and be somewhat dazzling. His procession to the temple still looked perfectly fine to him. On the surface, things still looked good, but as far as As far as he was concerned, that's all that mattered. Shallow surface appearance, not substance. That sums up Rehoboam's approach to living his life and serving his God. If you don't invest much, defeat doesn't hurt. And winning isn't exciting. Rehoboam didn't care that the splendor of the temple had been reduced to a substandard level of surface appearances. He didn't care that the symbol of excellence, excellence, integrity, and impurity had been removed from Israel. He didn't care because he never really invested in it. 
It was his father's investment and his grandfather's investment, not his own. It was they who had, through their faith and their dedication to God, turned Israel into a gleaming world power to God's glory. Rehoboam merely inherited it. So it was easy come, easy go. No real sacrifice, no major pain and defeat. So what do we learn? How does trading brass for gold apply to our lives? Well, in the New Testament, we're told that the temple in Jerusalem has been replaced by the hearts of each believer. Now the dwelling place of God is within God's redeemed community, the church. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? I believe that each of us begin our Christian walks with shields of gold filling the entrance of our hearts. You know, at that point when the word of God reached our hearts and Jesus definitely, clearly, incomparably in his majesty and grace became known to us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and and we respond to it by faith in the waters of baptism, we became part of his temple. And at that moment, the entrance to the temple of our hearts was lined full of pure gold shields. At that moment, there was purity and integrity and a desire to give ourselves to God and to serve him wholeheartedly. At that moment, we became part of God's temple collectively as his people. And with that new birth, with that new life coursing through our veins, it was so easy to be excited. It was so easy to be single-minded and absolutely committed to Christ. It was so easy to want to be with others who knew and understood the same glory and were dedicated to living out the same life. Do you remember that feeling of cleanness? That feeling of of commitment and purpose, of really knowing why you are who you are and why you exist, that feeling of surrender, I I do. I remember it, but I, I don't always feel it and I don't always live it. But, but to keep the glory of the golden shield in our temple takes a tremendous personal investment throughout our lives. That's the point. That's, that's what I'm trying to get at today. If we don't make the investment, soon a few of our best shields are replaced by the common shields of brass. When that happens, excellence, impurity, and integrity are replaced with what's calm and what's impure, what's inglorious. Without a constant investment, focus, and sacrifice, our pure, heartfelt faith will be replaced by shallow, surface religion of looking good and going through the motions. I'm not talking about works here. I'm not talking about anything other than focusing on our relationship with Jesus. But the question is, why why does it happen? It happens simply because gold shields are, are not kept without a struggle. Gold shields require protection. They require a guard because there's an enemy who wants them. And just like in our text today, it's the very same enemy that kept us in bondage in the first place before we knew Christ. Bill spoke of him already this morning. Sacrifice, therefore, needs to be made because the moment we set our sights on anything that's pure and noble, we can be sure that the enemy will mount an invasion. Do you remember those grand words, those gold shield words of Peter when he said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison or to death? Do you remember what Jesus said before this to encourage such a testimony of sacrifice and commitment? He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has has to sift you as wheat. The honorable intentions of Peter were met with the offensive from the enemy. Such is always the case. To live for Christ, to sacrifice for Christ, to serve Christ, to keep our hearts soft before Christ means constant attempts of invasion by the enemy and therefore we 
sometimes like Peter, hear the rooster crow three times. Does anyone who know, know who spoke these words about the great evangelist, D.L. Moody? He said, I have more trouble with D.L. Moody than any other man I know. Any guesses? It, it was D.L. Moody himself. <laughs> What a revelation. How refreshing that someone actually didn't place the blame for the brass on someone else. The greatest trouble each of us has is with ourselves. Do you believe that? Has that been your experience? Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, once told a story about a goose who was wounded and who landed in a barnyard with some chickens. He played with the chickens and ate with the chickens and after a while the goose thought he was a chicken. But then one day a flight of geese came overhead migrating to their home. They honked up there in the sky and the goose that lived like a chicken heard it. He heard it. That's when something stirred within the breast of the goose. Something called to him in the skies. He began to flap his wings that he hadn't used in such a long time. And he rose a few feet into the air, but then finding it too hard, he just stopped and he settled back down again. He heard the cry of the sky, but he settled for the mud of the barnyard. And that's the difference between living life to the full and living a life with some good. The difference is don't have anything to do with capabilities. The differences aren't about circumstances. The differences simply looking up and remembering who we were called to be and then setting our hearts on seeking the Lord. Today, the purpose of this message is just to tell you that unless you continue the fight or perhaps unless you pick up the fight again, what once was pure gold will become common brass. It's inevitable. Unless you invest your life completely in the cry for the sky, you will become content with the mud of the barnyard. It's not any room there for maybe because the enemy will take advantage of our complacency and make sure that it happens. It's not just about us. It's about the war that we're part of. Even sadder though, is the thought of contentment with living lives of brass. The thought that such loss would be, not be noticed and never really make much of an impact on our life because we never invested in our relationship with Christ. Not in the way that we should have. Not in the way that he would and could and wants to enable us to. Are you living your life for Christ by paying only the minimum payment due? And are you tired of the fight for excellence? Have you grown content with the barnyard of this world and the muddy prizes it has to offer? Or are your eyes still on the sky? Maybe like Rehoboam, you're only living off the investment that your parents made. How much are you invested personally in Christ? How much time, how much money, how much faith, how much prayer and effort have you invested in Christ? Not, not to earn anything, but purely out of love and gratitude. Because he's the only thing that really means anything to you. Rehoboam received God's grace, he did. His life continued. He was spared from God's judgment. Yay! But he still had to live a life burdened by the consequences of a bare minimum faith. He had a life of some good, but it wasn't what he could have had or could have become. It wasn't what God ultimately wanted for him. You see, the some good life is a life lived with some faith. It's a life lived without a heart that seeks the Lord. So as we come to the Lord's table, 
we must ask ourselves not only what has our faith cost us, but more to the point, what has our faith cost us lately? Not because we earn anything through our sacrifice. Christ's sacrifice paid it all. We're saved by grace through faith. Make that clear, absolutely clear. But being saved isn't the same as having living faith to the full. Receiving the benefits of Jesus is different from knowing and serving Jesus. If you don't invest much, defeat doesn't hurt. And winning isn't exciting. So if your faith motivates you and capture your imagination, the problem isn't with Jesus. It's your lack of investment. Just ask him to give you a new heart that wants to invest. And worst of, of all, without making our relationship with Christ the central place that it needs to be in our lives, we become users of God's grace instead of investors in the kingdom. Investors that should be excited about doing kingdom work more than anything else in our lives. Come to the table and ask Jesus to melt your heart and to take away any impurities that have crept in. Pray the prayer of David. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I'll have to ask the emblems to be passed out now as we sing the closing song. Thanks, Grant. I had a couple of thoughts kind of going through my mind as, as you were talking about this. One is that even though the seed of the Word of God is something that lives and grows on its own, we're warned not to let weeds grow up because they can life's pleasures and riches can choke out that seed if we let them. And the, I guess, and the other is, I guess, coming from a farm family, um, a goose that stays with the chickens... <laughs> in the barnyard, winds up with the same fate that they do. <laughs> but here at the table is where we hear the call of the sky again. And that's one reason we do this every week, to never forget, to never lose touch with the event that makes us who we are. Because he is our Lord. And we need to give him his way in our lives. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, thou art the potter, I am the clay, mold me and make me after thy will, while I me and try me, Master, today, whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being 
absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Paul tells us to, as often as we meet around this table, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. In a way, it, it's like saying, as often as we meet around this table, we're reminded that we were bought with a price, that we're reminded that who we are is based on what he's done. And there's never a time when we don't need to have faith. There's never a time when we don't need to depend. There's never a, a time when we don't need to surrender if we're going to live life to the full. We can wobble around in the barnyard, still be saved, still have some good, but that's not what we, we, we want, and that's certainly not what Christ wants, and that's not what he promised. We're new creation people. So go out into this world this week, and remember, it's not about your efforts, it's about your faith. God bless.